Ancient places speak of great civilizations that once flourished, then passed into memory. Though we have learned to decipher artifacts and ruins like this, mystery often dwells here. Why, with razor-sharp precision, do so many monuments of antiquity seem to point towards certain stars in the sky? Why do so many ancient texts contain references to strange flying objects centuries before the invention of the airplane? In all of the classical ancient cultures that we know of, there have been descriptions of unusual aerial phenomena. And in many cases, these can be interpreted as some kind of craft piloted by intelligent beings. What are UFOs? Do they exist? If so, could they originate from elsewhere in the universe? I think it's obvious that there are many other intelligent life forms in the universe, and I don't dismiss for a moment the possibility that they have uh, visited Earth, perhaps in the past, perhaps even now. With the recent discovery that life might have once existed on Mars, it is surely one of the most enduring of mysteries. Are we alone? Or have we been visited by travelers from other worlds? Join us as we attempt to unravel the riddle of ancient UFOs. Thousands of years we have gazed in awe at the night sky. In watching their slow yet relentless movement across the heavens, people discovered that the changing pattern of stars precisely matched the ebb and flow of seasons. This allowed for the development of the calendar and the rise of agriculture. But some objects in the sky followed neither pattern nor orderly path, seeming to defy the natural laws that bind all things. These unidentified flying objects, or UFOs, challenged human understanding, provoking a quest that continues to this day. You'd have to say that UFO evidence goes back uh, as far as man has left any records at all, because even in uh, ancient cave art, 20,000 years ago or so, in France and Spain, there are objects, uh, drawings, that look like uh, fl modern flying saucers. So you'd have to go back that far if you wanted to start some point in time when uh, the first UFO report was recorded. Forever frozen, in silence and in stone, these provocative drawings raise questions to which we may never find an answer. Do the shapes represent gods or ancestral spirits? Or are they ancient depictions of spacecraft, as many believe them to be? Texts from the world's earliest civilizations including Sumeria, some 5,000 years ago, mentioned strange aerial phenomena and the beings who controlled them. There are ancient records in which people describe different kinds of flying objects which they have seen. In some cases, the people were describing what they understood to be flying vehicles piloted by various categories of living beings. There are written accounts which describe this in great detail. Are we perhaps reading too much into images like this? A lot relates to how you interpret the signs that we see. Is a sketch on the wall an alien in a space helmet? Is it a diving helmet? Or is it just a decorative piece of work 
from a science fiction writer of several thousand years ago. So the further back you go, the harder it is to interpret. Despite increasing public support for the notion that UFOs may have been visiting the Earth since the dawn of history, the scientific community is overwhelmingly skeptical about the subject. Ancient people saw weird things in the sky, and they were convinced that these were symbols of God's intentions. Their lives were controlled by the gods. And in every case that I am aware of, there is an alternate explanation. It could have been a meteor, which they didn't understand. It could have been some ball lightning. It could have been any kind of thing that was just totally unknown to primitive man. And so they always interpret these things in terms of supernatural. Despite scientific skepticism, the annals of human affairs contain many curious examples of strange objects seen in the sky. One of the earliest written records of an encounter with a UFO comes from Egypt, more than 3,500 years ago. There's a story about Tutmos three Egyptian pharaoh who saw circles of fire in the sky and uh, started off with one, and then the report says that there were a few days later, there were many of them in the sky. And uh, he was, was so impressed that this was, uh, was recorded on a papyrus and uh, considered uh, very momentous. In the year 22 of the third month of the winter, a circle of fire appeared in the sky. After some days, it became more numerous and shone with the brightness of the sun, extending to the very limits of the heavens. The records of Pharaoh Tutmosis, 1480 BCE. Tutmosis was not alone. Eleven centuries later, during his invasion of Asia, the mighty Greek leader Alexander the Great is chronicled as having witnessed UFOs. While crossing a river in 329 before the Common Era, Alexander and his men observed what are described as gleaming silver shields in the sky. The objects repeatedly swoop down on the column of soldiers, scattering men and horses in panic. Seven years later, while attacking the Phoenician city of Tyre in the eastern Mediterranean, Alexander again encounters UFOs. Recorded by observers on both sides of the conflict, one of the objects suddenly shoots a beam of light at the city wall, which crumbles into dust, allowing Alexander and his troops to easily breach the defenses and take the city. The passage of centuries leaves us with little proof of whether the events really took place or were merely the products of fertile and imaginative minds. Remember, the working hypothesis for historians for hundreds of years has always been that mankind is alone, that there are no intruders from outer space, that there were no advanced civilizations, that our civilization, and each generation thinks this, is at the peak. We're it. Well, unless you throw out those assumptions, there's no way you're going to get at the truth of these old accounts. Many of the accounts are mystifying indeed, often from reputable and reliable sources. Medieval Europe was the scene of a mysterious incident in 1463, when a strange slab-like object appeared in the sky. Surrounded by flames and a bright light, it glided eerily above the landscape. This drawing was made by Hermann Schatten, a witness to the event. A century later, another witness recorded this unearthly occurrence above the skies of Nuremberg, Germany. On the morning of April 14, 1561, huge round cylinders appeared above the city. Smaller circular objects emerged from them, appearing to engage in battle with one another. Five years later, a similar display occurred above Basel, Switzerland. 
This time, many of the objects attacked one another, were consumed by fire, and then vanished without a trace. Once again, the encounter was documented by a local witness. By the early 19th century, the entire world seemed to be resonating to the mysterious presence of unidentified flying objects. What were they? Where did they come from? Countless theories were proposed. A lot of the ancient stories about UFOs are really stories about angels and leprechauns and things of that sort, which existed in the mythology of the time. They're, I think, a product of the very powerful fantasy ability of the mind. After all, everyone dreams. The subject of UFOs is a sensitive one, with supporters on opposing sides of an ongoing debate. We have today an enormous body of evidence of people seeing consistently reported beings in terms of their shape, their size, little details that indicate a phenomenon is going on where those beings are associated with spacecraft, flying saucers, call them what you want. So I think as an explanation, oh, people are just seeing the same leprechauns that they saw before, is a foolish explanation. Maybe the people back then were seeing the same little gray guys that are coming here now. For centuries, scholars have grappled with the question of what UFOs may be, the possible identity of their occupants, and where they may have come from. Many now look to an unlikely source for the answers. The saga of events that once played out against the landscape of the Middle East is enshrined in the Western world's most revered book, the Holy Bible. In recent years, the Bible has been increasingly touted by some scholars as a collection of stories describing encounters with aliens and UFOs. But the topic is controversial. Can the sacred nature of the biblical texts be challenged? With the decline of religion that has been experienced by a great many people, I think people are looking for an alternative that is more scientific. And so the possibility of life is one that has been suggested by scientists. So the next best thing to having a supernatural intervention in our world is to have UFOs visiting us from another civilization. So I think there's a certain would-be religious urge that has moved in the direction of supporting UFOs. The search for humanity's first possible contact with alien beings in prehistoric times leads to an unlikely place, to the Bible's earliest chapters, to the book of Genesis. Genesis describes conditions in the world at the dawn of time. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Genesis 6, 4. Who were the giants in the earth? And what exactly were the sons of God mentioned in the text? While most English Bibles use the word giants, the original Hebrew word is Nephilim. One translation of the word Nephilim is the men who came down, or those who came down, uh, meaning those who came down from the sky. So it may not mean necessarily that they're physical giants. They could just be uh, something like great heroes that uh, came down from the sky and produced a hybrid race. For many scholars, hoping to unlock the mystery of UFOs in the ancient world, the Bible contains other intriguing clues. The Bible is full of UFO references that can be interpreted as such, and they were 
very well recorded. One of the best examples of classic UFO story is the story of Moses. 3,500 years ago, an epic period in biblical history begins when Israelite slaves are finally released from bondage in Egypt. Under the leadership of Moses, they begin a 40-year trek through the wilderness and route to the Promised Land. But according to the Bible, Something very mysterious guides the multitude through the barren desert. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Exodus 14:21. Some believe the biblical passage contains another dimension to the meaning long cherished by most Christians and Jews. Some people interpret the uh, pillar of smoke and, and the pillar of fire that Moses followed through the wilderness as being uh, similar to a cigar-shaped UFO. It expresses a, a theme of, of an extraterrestrial intelligence, some sort of advanced form of life and intelligence that's guiding man, something that's higher than man. Some of the most intriguing biblical passages concern Mount Sinai and the handing down of the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke ascended as the smoke in a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked loudly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded and waxed louder, Moses spake and God answered. Exodus 19:18. When Moses returns with the Ten Commandments after his encounter with God or Jehovah on Mount Sinai, his skin mysteriously shines with an unearthly glow. His hair has turned snow white. The story of, of Moses has been tied in with an extraterrestrial encounter. His hair was turned white, which uh, some have linked with the uh, possibility of radiation exposure and so forth. It's easy to see how this could be uh, regarded as a, uh, a classic uh, UFO encounter. The notion that the Israelites may have been led to the promised land by some form of extraterrestrial entity has attracted many adherents in the last few decades. But understandably, scientists and religious leaders fiercely challenge the idea. We're dealing very much with an interpretation and we're dealing with uh, an issue that I think has potential for being highly controversial because after all, if you say that Jehovah is an E.T., then that changes the basis of Judaism and Christianity in a very fundamental way. But it is a question of interpretation. It's so easy to speculate. You can look at almost any story and find uh, something that could have been signs of an extraterrestrial. But what you have to do, if you want to have such an incredible explanation, you have to have very strong proof. Otherwise, you're just gullible. Hints at possible biblical connections with extraterrestrials, or UFOs, are not confined to the book of Exodus. In the second book of Kings, there is the intriguing story of the prophet Elijah, who lived around 900 years before the time of Jesus. While Elijah crosses the river Jordan with his son Elisha, a strange airborne craft appears. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind unto heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried and saw his father no more. 2 Kings 2, 11. 
In all ancient cultures, you will have descriptions of flying chariots of different kinds. For example, a chariot drawn by horses that flies through the sky and so on. In many cases, people today will interpret these as UFOs, that is, some kind of vehicle that flies under its own power. Just over three centuries after Elijah's ascent into heaven in a chariot of fire, another strange incident occurs. This time, it concerns the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. He is believed to have encountered alien spaceships on at least four separate occasions. In one account, he describes a clearly mechanical device under the control of human-like figures. I saw four wheels, one wheel beside each cherub. In appearance, they were like sparkling topaz, and all four were alike, like a wheel within a wheel. They moved in any four directions, never swerving from their course. Ezekiel 10, 8. Based on the biblical description of a strange flying device, in the 1960s, NASA engineer Joseph Bloomrich constructed this model. Is this what Ezekiel saw? I don't know what Ezekiel saw, if he saw anything. One possibility is he was dreaming. Another possibility, he had some hallucinogenic mushroom or something of that sort. Another possibility is that he met another tribe that might have had torches and, and masks that were very frightening to him. And he just saw something uh, otherworldly that he couldn't explain. And so he made up this story that uh, explained it as best as he could with the terms that he understood in his time. Whatever happened during the biblical period, an intriguing question remains. Could UFOs and extraterrestrials have been involved in some of the pivotal events in human history? Artifacts discovered throughout the Near East speak of a time when humanity's ancestors came to Earth from the heavens. Hundreds of clay tablets and cylinder seals depict human-like beings with wings, linking them with the sky, and always conspicuous, the stars. If you look at the uh, ancient history of the Near East, and consider the Sumerians and Babylonians, you'll find that these peoples believed that their civilization was given to them by beings who came down from the heavens. There's nothing in the historical record that is really conclusive. There are some intriguing stories in the records of Babylon, for example, but the human mind is so easily able to invent myths and fantasies that we have to take these ancient stories with a grain of salt. Yet archaeologists have often pondered on the exact process which led to civilization as we know it. For it was with the suddenness of a sunrise that human ingenuity and engineering skills arose from the Stone Age and burst forth onto the landscape of history. The Sphinx and the Great Pyramid at Giza are two of the greatest enigmas of all time. The exact dates of their construction are still cause for debate. How did ancient people develop the technology to build the Great Pyramid with a discipline and precision still unmatched today? The Great Pyramid of Egypt stands more than 450 feet tall. It weighs more than 6 million tons, and it has a footprint in excess of 13 acres. It's perfectly aligned to true north, south, east and west. To achieve that precision of alignment with a monument on this scale is an extraordinary technological feat and one that is continuously overlooked. 
by our scholars today. Suddenly, out of nowhere, this extraordinary monument, a high-tech achievement by any standards, just appears on the, on the desert. This is a great mystery, totally unexplained by conventional history, and one that requires us to use our minds and our imagination and intelligence to try to work out what on earth is going on here and what it says about the origins of human civilization, of the origins of our society, and our view of the past and where we came from. My sense is that uh, we're missing a huge part of the human story. I, I think it's possible, uh, indeed probable, that we are a species with amnesia, that we've lost the record of our story going back thousands of years before so-called history began. And I think if we could go back into that dark epoch, we would discover many astounding things about ourselves. Egypt and the Near East are not the only regions where ancient ruins provocatively taunt the mind with the mystery of how they came into being. There are many such places. This is one of them. The great ceremonial center known as Tiahuanaco in Bolivia. Not as old or as imposing as the pyramids of Egypt, what makes this site so unusual is its unique location. Some believe that it could not have been built without intervention from a superior source. The biggest blocks at Giza weigh 200 tons. The biggest blocks at Tiwanaku weigh 400 tons. 400 ton blocks of stone used to create enormous constructions, 12 and a half thousand feet above sea level, in an area where it's almost not possible to grow any food today. The altitude is so high that the crops come out of the ground stunted. And yet again, we're asked to believe that this was done with massive labor forces hauling on ropes, pulling these blocks along. It defies belief to imagine that this was how it was done. They, they, you could not support ever a large labor force at that altitude. Whether we like it or not, we're looking at the evidence of a technology and one that we don't understand. Like the Giza site, the site of Tiwanaku also incorporates extremely precise astronomical alignments. Perhaps the most perplexing site of all in South America is the Nazca Lines in Peru. Covering more than 200 square miles, a bewildering pattern of gigantic artwork litters the Nazca Plateau. In addition to figures of birds, spiders, and animals, Arrow straight lines stretch out to every point of the compass. Believed to have been laid down here more than 2,000 years ago, what was their purpose? Observable only from a great height, is this a canvas of signs and symbols etched in the sand to honor pagan gods? Or, as some people believe, do they contain hidden messages aimed at ancient travelers from the stars? These are very remarkable sculptures made by essentially moving pebbles so as to change the color tone of the desert surface. It appears that many of these uh, patterns of lines seem as though they're oriented towards uh, the heavens in some way. Uh, we really don't know what they were for or what the uh, or how they were interpreted by the people who made them. I think that uh, this may be one explanation that uh, the Naskins were projecting these into the sky and using them for uh, religious and ceremonial purposes. But the Nazca lines really uh, do constitute a mystery. No one really knows what they were for. Like so much of the ancient world, Nazca broods silently, 
its secrets lost in time. Asia, ageless land of a thousand legends. It is also a continent of intriguing mysteries. During the 1920s, while exploring northern China, famous Russian artist Nicholas Rarick wrote of a remarkable incident in the Himalayas. On August 5th, we were in our camp, and at about half past nine, some of our caravanners noticed a huge shining oval shape flying high overhead. It came from the north at great speed, crossing our camp before disappearing into the clear blue sky. It had a bright, luminous surface, brilliant in the sun. Nicholas Rarich. Travel Diary, 1926. In the long history of this vast and beautiful continent, has the UFO phenomenon shaped myths and stories handed down from generation to generation? A brief glance at the texts of ancient India is revealing, for here too we find the haunting presence of strange phenomena observed in the sky. Gurkha, flying a swift and powerful Vimana, hurled a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose with all its splendor. The Mahabharata. Compiled some two to three thousand years ago, the Mahabharata is a Hindu poem written in Sanskrit. Ten times longer than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey combined, it is a saga of conflict on a cosmic scale. The plot of the Mahabharata, which is the great epic of ancient India, has to do with an invasion of the earth by uh, negative extraterrestrial forces. Basically the idea was that governments of the earth were taken over by beings coming from other planets who had the desire to control and exploit the situation for their own personal benefit. The story goes on to describe how godly forces intervened and finally there was a great battle here on the earth in which the issue was resolved and the negative forces were repelled. Another epic poem, the Ramayana, was written more than 2,000 years ago. It too tells of conflict and conflagration in India's distant past. The Vimana was a weapon so powerful that it could destroy the earth in an instant. It made a great soaring sound in smoke and flames, and on it sits death, the Ramayana. Prominently featured in all these stories are strange flying devices referred to as Vimanas. What were they? Could they have been UFOs? The Vimana is described in some detail and its flight pattern is also described. It's quite interesting because it is very similar to the pattern of flight which is described in the context of modern UFO sightings. For example, the Vimana would move in a very abrupt zigzag fashion. It would sometimes disappear from sight. The earth shook, scorched by the terrible violent heat of this weapon. Elephants burst into flame and ran to and fro in frenzy. Over a vast area, other animals crumpled to the ground and died. 
from all directions. The arrows of flame rain continuously and fiercely from the Vimanas. The Mahabharata. They were described as flying fortresses that were used for aerial battles. They also attacked uh, people on the ground. They were they were uh, they sent out missiles according to the, these translations, interpretations. Sort of like a modern UFO report, except the war was taking place. Could great aerial battles have been possible more than two thousand years ago? Compelling though the stories may be, were they fact or fantasy? I think the ancient Hindu descriptions of flying machines are probably uh, fantasies sort of like the Buck Rogers myths of flying rocket ships long before they really existed. The easy way out is mythology, old science fiction, if you will. The realistic way is to say that those people were describing things that they didn't understand but that were real. What we need is an open-minded effort to look at these things from the viewpoint of modern technology, possibly admitting that even we can't do some of the things that are described. While many now believe that the Earth has been visited by extraterrestrials in their spacecraft, could this indeed have been possible? Reports of strange, unidentified flying objects have continued to trickle in throughout the centuries, echoing incidents in ancient times. In the 1940s, the term flying saucer had entered the vocabulary of a stunned and fascinated world. Suddenly, seemingly everywhere, the skies were filled with UFOs of every description. In the ensuing decades, UFOs were witnessed by people from all levels of society. Even astronauts saw them. I personally believe in UFOs, and I believed in UFOs before I got into the space program. I just, I just personally believe that uh, there are other civilizations somewhere out there that uh, people are traveling from. This was in the early 1950s when I was flying fighters in Germany. And these objects were coming over our base that appeared to be the same kind of formations that we fly in our fighters. On occasion, their movements were more erratic than ours, which meant they could really accelerate laterally and accelerate fore and aft more readily than we do. But we felt that they looked very much like high-flying fighters, except they had no wings. They were certainly higher and faster than any airplanes we know of here on Earth at that particular time. And they certainly appeared to be saucer-shaped and metallic. If extraterrestrials are visiting the Earth, why are UFOs so seemingly secretive and elusive? Some believe that question can only be answered by face-to-face -face contact with them. What would happen if extraterrestrials landed on the White House lawn and announced themselves publicly? Would everyone panic? First of all, it depend on what kind of uh, extraterrestrials they were, if they were the, uh, the uh, saviors that uh, the contactees talked about in, in back in the 50s, or are they the aliens uh, of the alien movie eating people alive? Of course, I think uh, if they were benevolent, I don't think uh, people would panic. I think uh, they'd be more worried about what would happen to the stock market nowadays. In 1977, NASA sent two robotic Voyager spacecraft on an ambitious exploratory tour to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the four giant outer planets.
Their epic journey took 12 years to complete, but they acquired more scientific data about our solar system than had been learned in the previous five centuries. Could this be the UFO's mission to planet Earth? To explore our world on behalf of another technologically advanced civilization somewhere in the far-flung reaches of the cosmos? They're probably the same as we would be if we were going to uh, some planet several billion miles away that we would uh, stop off to visit or look at and explore. We would do it probably very cautiously if we knew they were habitated and perhaps they're just uh, passing by or maybe doing some exploration. When my backyard is open any night and I go out every night and say, come on guys, land in my backyard, and give me my spacecraft check out and let me fly. And I'd be delighted to interface with them. While we now know that the chances of finding intelligent life in our solar system are extremely unlikely, our sun is but one of billions in our galaxy. And the galaxy itself is but one of countless galaxies spread throughout the universe. With these odds, can we be alone? Did our ancestors perhaps know something about the cosmos that we no longer know? In August 1996, NASA announced that life might once have existed on Mars. Just a few months earlier, the first planet orbiting another sun was confirmed. Though eight light years away, a staggering 50 trillion miles from Earth, on the cosmic scale, that is literally just down the road from our own backyard. So, could our unannounced, unnamed visitors have indeed journeyed to us from another world? Today, we know a lot about the universe, and we know there really is a possibility that there could be life out there. But most of what you hear about it is nonsense, because people accept the most bizarre stories without proof. And there are many stories from all over the world of people seeing strange lights in the sky. Some of them are true. There are strange lights in the sky, but they usually have an explanation. There are all kinds of things going on around us, and the average person doesn't know about this, and they see something weird, and they say, wow, it must be extraterrestrial. So there's a tremendous amount of gullibility all over the world. We live on a planet revolving around a star, in the middle of an unknown infinity of space. Isn't it arrogant and stupid to imagine that we're the only life in this enormous universe? If you take our ancient texts seriously, they all tell us that the universe was created as a home for life, that the universe is full of life. I think it's obvious that there are many other intelligent life forms in the universe and I don't dismiss for a moment the possibility that they have uh, visited Earth perhaps in the past perhaps even now. Perhaps our cosmic visitors were here many times at the beginning of human history. Perhaps they brought with them a message from the stars that may still lie buried within these stones and ruins. If they were here, perhaps they will return. Perhaps humanity's greatest adventure, a face-to-face -face encounter with intelligent life not of this earth, may occur again. And just perhaps, that day may not be too far away. While we sleep, our brains are cut off from the outside world, and for most of the night they lie dormant. But at regular 90 minute intervals, we enter rapid eye movement, or dream sleep. In REM, the mind is more active than in the waking state. The reason for such frenetic activity, at a time when the brain apparently has little to do, 
is one of the great puzzles facing modern science. But now evidence is emerging that in REM, the mind enters an altered state of consciousness in which it sends and receives information in ways that we don't yet understand. I decided to have a sleep in the afternoon and I was laying down on the bed. I um, was just sort of dozing and certainly hadn't fallen asleep and after a little while I actually felt my body rising, although it wasn't my body because I could still see my body on the bed laying face down and I very, very gradually rose up and up until I m must have been very near the ceiling and I just stayed there looking down on myself on the bed. I went to bed. It was summer. I went to sleep. The next thing I remember was looking down. I was looking down on my bed. I could see my bed beneath me. I just thought, this is strange. It was just like looking through norm normal vision. No, no dreams or anything like that. It was clear, clear crystal cut vision. And I recognized my duvet, um, my bedside table. And I recognized the person in the bed. And I could see that person. I thought, gosh, that must be me. Out-of-body experiences are more common than you might think. Surveys indicate that between 19 and 27 percent of us claim to have had one. They're often associated with near-death experiences, but in fact, they most commonly arise from sleep. It's possible simply to dream about leaving your body, but those who've had an out-of-body experience are often convinced it was real. I was awake when it happened. I was awake when it started and I was awake when it finished. So I know I was awake. So it could not have been a dream. Until it actually happens to you and you realise how real it is and how certain you are that that is what's happened, you know it's not a dream. You know you're not making it up. It is crystal clear. Dr Charles Tart is a psychologist and sleep researcher who's been studying out-of-body experiences since the 1960s. Well, there are two theories about it. The one theory is that an out-of-the-body experience is pretty much what it seems to be. There, there's some real sense in which your mind leaves your body and goes somewhere else. And then there's the other main school of theories says that, of course, that's impossible. It's really just some kind of vivid dream which you seem like you're out of your body and your mind is clear, but of course it couldn't possibly be. In 1966, Dr. Tart was running a sleep lab at the University of California. That year, a family friend told him she'd been having out-of-body experiences since childhood. She thought it was perfectly normal that you went to sleep, you floated up near the ceiling for a few minutes, you woke up and went to school. She thought that was what sleep was like for everyone. She had never read anything about out-of-the-body experiences or other things like that. She was quite naive that way. So I thought this was fascinating to get a report from someone who, who hadn't been influenced by what other people believed about it. It's impossible to predict when an out-of-body experience, or OBE, is going to take place. Up until now, no one had been able to capture one in the lab. The woman presented an opportunity to find out what happened to the brain during the experience. In the lab, Tart installed a shelf high above the bed. The woman was connected to an EEG machine to measure her brain waves and was sent to bed. After she was wired up and in bed, I would then go off to another room, 
use a random number table to get a five-digit random number, which I'd write on a piece of paper and slip it in an opaque folder. And then I'd come in and put it up on a shelf near the ceiling, a flat shelf. So the number was not visible to anyone down in the room, much less on the bed, but if you happened to be viewing the room from near the ceiling, you could clearly read the number. And I put a clock near the number also. And I told her, I mean, this sounds terribly preposterous, but I said, if you leave your body, try to float up to a position where you can not only read and memorize the number, but see what time it is also, and then try to wake up right afterwards so I can have an exact idea of when you had that particular part of the experience. Todd changed the number every day. On the first three mornings, the woman said she felt as though she'd left her body during the night. But she couldn't say what the number was. She said that while she was out of her body, she was in the wrong part of the room, or she was outside the building or something like that. She had no idea what the number was because she hadn't seen it. Then, on the fourth night, the subject woke up suddenly at about 3.35 in the morning. She said she'd just had an out-of-body experience, in which she'd risen to the top of the room. She claimed she had seen the number. She successfully told me that the number was 25132. Now, the odds of guessing a five-digit number like that in one try are enormous. So, I was quite excited, to put it mildly. Tart examined the EEG readings of the electrical activity produced by the woman's brain. At the point that she believed she left her body, they had changed dramatically. I had looked at many brainwave patterns of sleep over the years, and her brainwaves were simply unlike anything I'd seen before. When she had the OBE, the woman's brain was producing alpha waves. In the rest of us, these are produced in the waking state and are rarely seen during sleep. It seemed that while she was asleep, part of her brain was behaving as though it was awake. Anyone who was familiar with sleep wave patterns looking at them would say, this is unusual. I don't normally see this. Not long after that night, the woman moved away, and she and Tart lost touch. It meant that the experiment was never reproduced, and skeptics began to ask whether the whole thing might have been a fraud. There was no possibility she could know what the number was by any normal means before I put it on the shelf. The paper with the number on it was never visible to myself or to her. Was it possible that the woman could have somehow climbed up to look at the number? She couldn't get up to stand on the bed to look at the number because in order to do that it would have pulled all the electrodes off of her scalp which would have picked up so much interference that ink would have been flung all over the room from the brainwave recording. It would have been a very notable event. I would have been covered in ink. At around the same time that Tart was studying OBEs in California, Stanley Krippner was running a sleep lab in New York. He read about Tart's experiment and noticed that the skeptics were having trouble discrediting it. How is this woman able to get those numbers? The only criticism that I have heard of that really makes any type of sense is that she had a collapsible mirror with her, and she was able to unfold this mirror and extend the mirror up above the number, and in the dark, with a little flashlight, beam the flashlight up to the mirror and read the numbers. As long as we're going to go along those lines, you might as well say, perhaps I made the whole thing up. And in fact, when people think that perhaps I have lied about this whole thing, I take it as a great compliment to how well the experiment was done that critics are reduced to that extreme. But if the results were authentic, the implications were astonishing. Was it really possible for the conscious mind to leave the physical body? Krippner decided to run an experiment to see if he could reproduce Tart's results. We had one medical student who claimed that he was able to have out-of-body experiences frequently. We said, fine, come into the laboratory and Every night, we're going to put a picture on a ledge above your bed. Nobody will know what the picture is because it will be completely shielded 
until we pull the shield off and see if you can dream about it. On the fourth night, Krippner witnessed a sudden change in the young man's brain waves. As he slept, waking alpha waves appeared. He woke up and said, I've had an out-of-body experience. And he said, the picture has a sunset on it. And sure enough, the name of the picture had the word sunset in it. Brainwave recordings in both the Tart and Krippner experiments showed that during the out-of-body experiences, the subjects had entered a mixed state of consciousness, part asleep, part awake. In part two, we'll look at another mysterious state in which the dreaming and waking minds overlap. Like the OBEs, it too leads those who experience it to claim they have seen the impossible. it's like to have a nightmare but for the victims of a mysterious condition the nightmare becomes reality it was in a dream it was I was dreaming but I say I used to wake up because it was like I used to wake up in the dream this was in my bedroom I was in my bed so I thought I was awake, and I couldn't move. It was like a force. I was just held there. I could not move, but I could move my eyes, and I could hear, and I knew he was there. And then I heard him walking down the corridor. I was trying to scream so much by this time, but I couldn't speak. I looked with my eyes sideways and the door was wide open, and there was this man, and he was standing there, like a monk. He started to walk around the bed, and the fear in my stomach and in my chest, I, I can't describe it. On this particular night, I'd slept quite well, and it was, I would say, around about the four o'clock time in the morning that this happened. I felt that I was wide awake. All of a sudden, I felt that something ominous at the bottom of the bed, a dark shape or figure, was down there, and it wasn't standing up, it was down low at the bed and was tugging at the, at the bed clothes. I woke up cold. And I opened my eyes. I found I couldn't move. The next thing I knew, I was being dragged out of bed. I felt totally unable to move a muscle. Very suddenly, without any warning at all, there was this dark, heavy weight that seemed to land right across my body, right across my chest. There was no being there, no human being there, but there was something there. It meant to harm me. She just got control of me and there was nothing I could do about it. I really expected to die. 
I really thought that this is it, this is death. If I had to just lay there, that would take me. Yeah, I've been dead. If you ask me my opinion, I would say that uh, not wishing to sound like somebody who's out of their mind, you see, is to say that it wasn't a dream. It was too vivid for a dream, it's too real. I wish it hadn't happened, but it did happen. It did happen, and it was real. I would have thought that it was some sort of presence. I can't work out what it was. The first academic to investigate these accounts of strange bedroom visitors was Professor David Hufford of the University of Pennsylvania. In 1970, I went to Newfoundland, Canada to do field work on traditional supernatural beliefs. I looked around, I talked to some people, and I found a tradition called the Old Hag, which was a belief about a terrifying thing that happened to people during the night. When people had the old hag, they woke up uh, during the night, they were unable to move, something would come into the room, that might sometimes be called the hag, uh, and pressed on them. And people in Newfoundland, those who knew the tradition, said that if this happened, and if it went on long enough without being interrupted, that it could kill people. Professor Hufford decided to investigate further. Back in the U.S., he devised a survey to try to find out whether anyone there had ever woken up paralyzed with some strange presence in the room. To his astonishment, he found that almost one in five had had the exact same experience. Most of them have never told anybody. A few of them will tell a spouse or a parent. A couple of them have told me that they told their priest or their minister or their rabbi. Uh, but very, very few, 90, 95% have never told anybody. In my experience, people are not afraid that they're going mad. They're afraid that if they tell someone, they will think they're going mad. Although these experiences seem to be a taboo subject in contemporary America, in fact, people have been recording them for hundreds of years. In medieval Europe, the mayor was a demon that came in the night to paralyze and crush down on the chest of its victims. In its original usage, the Anglo-Saxon word nightmare referred specifically to an attack by the night demon. This kind of experience does have a very, very long history. In fact, I have examples going back as far as we have historical records. We find cultures all over the world having traditions about the paralysis attacks. I don't know any culture anywhere in the world that I've looked at that doesn't turn out to have a fairly rich tradition about this. Since you find it in all cultures, and since you find it in all the places we have a record, I would imagine that it simply goes back as far as humans do. Hufford collected literally thousands of these stories. In each culture, the experience was given a different name, and usually interpreted as the work of demons or witches. But however they were interpreted, the stories all seemed to be referring to the same experience. Hufford decided to call it a paralysis attack. He turned his attention to modern-day folk beliefs. Suddenly, out of the blue, I woke up three o'clock in the morning, terrified, panic-stricken, paralyzed. I knew exactly what was going on. Three entities were in the room. I could see all around the room. I was completely coherent, completely awake, just immobile. With fear, I don't know whether they they did, they did something to make me immobile, I don't know. One entity crossed the room, walked like a normal person, approached me at the bed, and leant down right into my face. I entered another dimension of fear that I could not even 
begin to describe. It's like primal, raw. What else I remember is some kind of thing being drilled into my ear, and that was it. I was awake. It was eight, eight o'clock in the morning, and that was it. I had, I had that amount of missing time, four or five hours missing. Don't know what happened. Mark Routley is convinced that he is being visited and experimented on by beings from another planet. He says they've been coming to his bedroom at night since he was a small child. You're alone, it's quiet, it's dark and you're vulnerable. And they can do it and they can come in without you having any knowledge because you're already asleep, you're asleep. They arrive, and they immobilize you, you wake up and you're already snared, that's it. And they take you and you're gone. Nobody knows. Nobody bat an eyelid because everybody's asleep. I would say that's why. Makes sense, doesn't it? In Newfoundland, a person who wakes up, hears footsteps approaching, senses a threatening presence, feels pressure on the chest, says, I had the old hag last night, and it was somebody must be after me with witchcraft. Now, somebody in the U.S. who doesn't know about or believe in witchcraft has the same experience. Here's the footsteps, here's something approaching them, feels the pressure, feels the terror, may say, I think that I was abducted by aliens last night. According to ufologists, 95% of people who report being abducted by aliens describe a strange bedroom visitor which arrives in the night to paralyze them. The experience is uncannily similar to the paralysis attack. In 1995, Roper conducted a poll to determine how widespread alien abductions were. A key question was, do you remember waking up in the night paralyzed with a strange presence in your room? 18% answered yes, and ufologists interpreted this as evidence that up to 30 million Americans had been visited by aliens. But for Hufford, a more likely explanation was that they had been the victims of paralysis attacks. I have seen accounts of people from old records who said they were ridden by a witch and recent accounts that people have told me that make them think that they are being visited by aliens where I am sure they're talking about the same kind of experience. There's no doubt in my mind that many people who think that they must have been abducted have no reason whatsoever to think that. They're simply responding to a classic paralysis attack and nothing else. But the fact that alien abductions seemed to be part of the old hag tradition didn't explain the attacks themselves. What gave rise to them? Did the victims have psychological problems? Or was there a scientific explanation? Hufford was convinced that the answer was to be found in the sleep lab. The EEG machine measures the brain's activity during sleep. For most of the night, our brains are resting. This lack of activity is indicated by relatively slow, sloping brain waves. But every 90 minutes, we enter a period of REM sleep. Our brains become frenetically active, and the slow waves are replaced by faster movements. The brain is now dreaming. In REM, our muscles are immobilized to prevent us from acting out our dreams. Experts call it sleep paralysis. We all experience it every time we enter dream sleep. Hufford realized that paralysis was a key feature of both the attacks and of dream sleep. Could it be that the visions of the old hag were just dreams? The only problem with this explanation is that victims were convinced they were awake. People may say it's a nightmare. I say it was real. It happened. This was uh, a total real situation. Not like a dream at all. 
Brainwave recordings taken during the paralysis attacks showed elements of both wakefulness and REM sleep. The victims had entered a mixed state of consciousness. They were awake, able to see and hear the things around them, but at the same time they were paralyzed and dreaming. During these experiences, people do seem to perceive the environment accurately, and then they also perceive often these presences that seem clearly impossible, or certainly bizarre. It's not unreasonable to say that they are dreaming and awake at the same time, or that you might call this a waking dream of some kind. Calling it a mixed state of dreaming and, and wakefulness is a good way to put it. But Hufford couldn't help thinking that there was a problem with the scientific explanation. If these experiences were just dreams, why was it that everyone was having the same dream? It was possible that the sense of evil was triggered by the fear brought on by the experience of waking up paralyzed. But it seemed unlikely that a single emotion could generate such extraordinary similarities in the accounts. What's so puzzling about this experience is that if you ask a hundred different people about their most recent dream, you get a hundred different accounts. If you ask a hundred people about their most recent paralysis attack, it sounds like they all had the same dream. And not identically, but there is tremendous similarity in a very complex event. In developed countries, most people have never heard of the old hag or the night demon. Yet when they report the experience, it's virtually the same as the classic old hag attack. 85% are convinced that an evil presence has entered the room. Many believe it to be pressing down on their chest. Large numbers hear footsteps and even the sound of breathing. Professor Hufford has identified more than 30 common elements to the attacks. Sounds of footsteps, feelings of pressure, feeling that it's evil, they recur all over the world. Different cultures, different languages, but the pattern of the experience is strikingly the same over and over again. I realized I could not move. I was just held there. I could not move. But I could I couldn't move my move eyes. Muscle. I was totally paralyzed. I knew there was somebody there. And there I was no breathing. human being there. There was something there. I could actually feel that it was a dark figure. If I had to just lay there, I'd be dead. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be here now. I feel sure I would have died. I really thought that this is it. This is death. If they gave us a lot of different, bizarre accounts, I would say that we had it explained, because that's what happens when you dream. It's the fact that their accounts have all of these detailed patterns that uh, nobody has been able to give a good explanation for so far. I've seen some of the explanations. They're not good. It's one of those strange things where the more you know, the more mysterious it gets. Victims of the attacks are convinced that they've been visited by some supernatural presence. In today's rational world, we know this to be impossible. But perhaps because we know so little about the workings of the sleeping mind, the attacks remain a mystery that science has yet to explain. times, men have believed that dreams have mystical powers. They were seen as the gateway to the psychic world. In the dream state, it was possible to gain knowledge of distant and even future events. It's a belief that has persisted to the present day. It was almost like the dream I was in was interrupted and my sister suddenly appeared before me and she said to me, it's really happening this time, it's really happening, I need help, it's really happening, he's not kidding anymore. The next day when I woke up, um, I called her and it turned out that at the time that I was having that dream, this man she had been dating was trying to rape her.
All I can remember is being on a ship. Didn't know what type of ship it was, but I was on a ship. It was very, very dark. It was very, very cold. And there was an awful lot of water. An awful lot of water. The water was actually inside the ship that I was on. And there were people scrambling, trying to get out. I woke up, went to watch GMTV with my cup of coffee. And there was news that a ferry had sunk and it was the Herald of Free Enterprise. And what I was seeing on the television was my dream. Around 50% of us claim to have had a telepathic dream, in which we've somehow received information without the use of our ordinary senses. But such dreams are almost always recounted after the dreamed about event has taken place. So it's impossible for sleep experts to say whether there's anything to them. This could be due to chance. We do dream many times a night. And sooner or later, one of our dreams, just by chance, is going to match what somebody we know is thinking or doing. Of course, this, I'm sure, happens all the time. There are many very conventional ways of explaining psychic dreams and we want to exhaust all of those possibilities before we take too much credence in the possibility that something really was anomalous, really was special, extraordinary, worth looking into. When ESP occurs in everyday life, it usually occurs in what we call an altered state of consciousness. For this reason, when we started our investigations into ESP, we did work with the telepathic dream. Thirty years ago, Stanley Krippner devised a series of experiments which he hoped would settle the question of whether dream telepathy was a real or imagined experience. These experiments, which were to become known as the Maimonides studies, were to produce some of the most astonishing results in the history of sleep science. When the whole technology of rapid eye movements and electroencephalograms came up, we thought, why not study these events scientifically? These phenomena have been reported in virtually every human culture since the dawn of history. They, like any other verbal report or human experience, are certainly worthy of our serious attention. Whatever we find out is sure to be worthwhile. The plan was simple. Krippner wanted to find out whether a person's dreams could be influenced telepathically by a sender, a psychologist locked away in a different part of the lab. Robert van der Castle, a sleep researcher with a reputation for telepathic dreams, was one of his first subjects. I would go up to Brooklyn. There would be somebody I was going to be working with that night. I was the receiver, or percipient is what they called it. And so there's going to be somebody who's going to be a sender, somebody who's going to look at a picture and try and send it, whatever that means, or transmit it. So I would usually briefly interact with that person. We might go out for a walk, we might go down to the drugstore and get a Coke, and just, just kind of, you know, get, get some good vibes between us. Maybe they had a pleasant dinner together, or a bedtime snack, achieving rapport, getting to know each other. Then they were separated. And I would be put into one bedroom, all of the electrodes attach up here in my head and around my eyes and chin and so forth and then the door shut so I'm locked in for the night I can't go any place the psychologist was given a sealed envelope with some sort of a picture in it and this was chosen randomly tossing dice they had that sealed envelope they would go down to a distant room in the hospital they were locked in there for the night. Then once they were locked in, they could open up the envelope and see what the picture was. Then during the night, they would try and look at this picture, concentrate on it, try and see it as clearly as they could, and then, quote, send it or transmit it to me as the dreamer in the distant part of the hospital. One of our psychologists spent most of the night looking at a picture, trying to project or transmit the image of that picture into the dreams of the sleeping subject. We watched the electroencephalographic machine very closely to see what types of brain waves and what type of eye movements the subject was demonstrating. 
when he began to produce rapid eye movements, we knew that he was dreaming. Michael, wake up. Um, can you tell me what's been going through your mind now? I was... I was at a circus and was laughing at a clown in a big red suit. I would be dreaming and then somebody would call my name and say, hey, Bob, and wake up and, you know, do you remember what was going through your mind as they would, you know, this was going through and this was going through and that would all be tape recorded. Okay, thank you. You can go back to sleep now. Ninety minutes later, once again, they'd call my name. I'd wake up and do you remember what was going through your mind? Yes, this was going, this, 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 and it was all be recorded. So that went on continuously throughout the night. From the first night, van der Castle's dreams began to change. I was quite familiar with what I usually dreamed about. I knew what my usual kind of dreams were. And my dreams were being altered because I was dreaming repeatedly about things I don't ordinarily dream about. I'm dreaming about something very sensationalistic and totally out of sync or out of sequence with what I usually was dreaming about. I knew these were not, in a sense, my dreams. On his first night in the lab, Van der Castle dreamed of a young man wearing a long white robe. He was taking part in some kind of Catholic ceremony. In the dream, the ritual had some national or historic significance. It was taking place at somewhere called Atlantic Beach. Many of my dreams at night involve uh, images of, of choir boys and uh, church scenes and big uh, uh, crucifixes, crosses on big white furl flags and so forth. The target picture that night was Dali's The Discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. It depicts the young Columbus in a dream about his future voyage across the Atlantic. The Virgin Mary is shown on a banner borne by Columbus. Catholic acolytes bearing crosses stride towards the Atlantic beach. The similarities between dream and target were striking. If we looked at the, the picture, then I had various details all through my dreams that corresponded my dream imagery with that detail in the actual picture that was being sent. So there was a strong correspondence between many of the individual elements and what was in the target picture. The uncanny similarities continued. On each of the next four nights, Van der Castle's dreams contained key elements of the target painting. But by the sixth night, whatever signal he'd been picking up seemed to have been lost. That night, it was just the recall was, I just couldn't seem to get much in the way of dreams. I couldn't get any scenes. I couldn't get any people. I couldn't get any action. So I thought, wow, I'd really failed on it. Van der Castle was convinced that he'd somehow lost contact with the sender. At the end of his first dream, all he could remember was something about a house. The same image recurred in his second, third, fourth, and fifth dreams of the night. So I said, well, to me, the target picture tonight would have to be without any people, because I had, had hardly anybody all night long, you know, a couple little dingy houses. So if we got a picture in there, no people, little dingy houses, and, you know, et cetera, then we did great. The target painting for that night was Cezanne's Trees and Houses. Copies of Van der Castle's dream reports were sent to a panel of independent judges. Their job was to compare the dreams to that night's target painting. They were given a score, depending on how closely they matched the target. On six of the eight nights he spent at Maimonides, Van der Castle got a rating of one, a direct hit. The odds against this happening by chance were over a million to one. Krippner wanted to be certain that there was no room for fraud. We had three magicians come in and look at our work, look over our research protocol, uh, study the ways that we tried to make our 
our laboratory foolproof? They said no, they did not see how anybody could have cheated. Others at Maimonides were also scoring some remarkable hits. One subject dreamed of walking through the French quarter of a city. In another dream, he walked up the side of a hill, through the layers of a French town, and in a third, he met a group of men dressed as French policemen. The target for that night was Chagall's surrealist painting, Paris Through a Window, which depicts a hilly Paris skyline. One time we used a picture by a Japanese artist, Hiroshigi, called Downpour at Shono, showing this cold man with a little umbrella above his head walking on this Japanese mountain. And not only did the psychologist have to look at the picture, the psychologist had to go into the shower and take a cold shower that night. The dreamer dreamed about Japan, dreamed about a rainstorm, dreamed about a mountain, dreamed about everything that was on that picture. In all, the studies at Maimonides lasted nearly 10 years. Krippner and his colleagues used hundreds of subjects in the most systematic attempt to study dream telepathy ever made. We did find evidence of an anomalous phenomenon, something that was very difficult to explain through ordinary means. If people want to use the word telepathy to explain it, fine. All that we're saying is it was something that beat the laws of chance, sometimes by 20 to 1, sometimes by 100 to 1, sometimes by 1,000 to 1. Starved of funds, Maimonides had come to an end in 72. Since that time, Nothing on a similar scale was ever attempted, and the work has been largely ignored by the scientific establishment. But then, in the winter of 95, Dr. Dean Radin, a statistician from the University of Nevada, decided to look again at the Maimonides data. There had been thousands of individual experiments. Radin knew that statistically, the greater the number of experiments, the greater the degree of certainty they could produce. Using this idea, he recalculated the probability that chance alone could have produced the matches between the pictures and the dreams. A scientist is never absolutely sure about anything, but what we can do is assign the likelihood of something being true or not. The odds against chance for what we actually saw in those, ex in those studies is 75 million to one. What that allows us to do is say that we, we can't exclude chance because after all it could be that one in 75 million, but the likelihood is extremely small. If I, if I had to bet on this and make a choice, if I were forced to make a choice in one direction or the other, I would bet that we're dealing with real telepathy in these experiments. But how could this evidence be explained? Why was telepathy more likely to occur in dreams than in wakefulness? What was it that was special about the dream state? At Maimonides, a technique known as Gansfeld was developed as a way of replicating the dream state during wakefulness. Today, it's being used as a way of reproducing the original dream telepathy studies. In the Gansfeld procedure, we put somebody into a state of mild sensory deprivation. So we put half ping pong balls over their eyes and shine a red light onto their face. The headphones they wear carry white noise. And what that does is direct all their attention inwards. So they ignore external stimuli and they suddenly become very um, sensitive to internal ideas and images. And for about 20 minutes, we asked them just to tell us about the ideas and thoughts that go through their mind. Um, and I carry on rising up into the sky. And I can see islands. 
At the same time, someone else in another room concentrates on some kind of target. There might be a picture postcard or a video clip. What we're looking for is some kind of match-up between the nature of that target and what the person who's in the Gansfeld state is saying. In Gansfeld studies, like this one at the University of Edinburgh, the matches between the target video pictures and the dreamlike images of the subjects consistently exceed chance. What we see in the Gansfeld is, in my own research, 47% response rate, which is almost double what you'd expect by chance. If it's a coincidence in this lab, then it's also a striking coincidence that is happening in other labs worldwide. It's not the result of one experiment or of one experiment. It's many, many people doing many, many studies. And this builds a, an incredibly persuasive database. The dream telepathy experiments give a certain result, and the Gansfeld experiments give almost exactly the same result. Both of those are looking for telepathy. And the fact that you get the same kinds of results in both cases is extremely convincing. As access to the external world is closed off, the brain turns inward, dipping down into deeper levels of consciousness. It's a state very similar to dreaming. And this has led psychologists to speculate that sensory deprivation may be the key to understanding telepathy. You can think of this as something like uh, a, a range or a spectrum of awareness. Most of the time we're right on the top, our surface level awareness. But there's all kinds of things going on underneath that, very, very deeply all the way down. In dream states and in the Gansfeld state, what's happening is that the, there's not very much happening at the surface level because the senses have been cut off. And we're able to pay attention to a little bit lower in the spectrum of awareness. And the deeper we go down into there, the more we're able to get access to things that we're not ordinarily aware of or can pay attention to. If psychic ability exists, it's clearly not a large ability that we're using all of the time, otherwise we'd notice it, there'd be no debate about it. It must be something that's very subtle. And one possibility is that this psi information, if you like, is in our unconscious. And we need to be in a psychologically quiet state in order to gain access to it. And that state might come about if we're dreaming, in a relaxed uh, sort of sleep state, or in the Gansfeld state, when we've had external stimulation cut off, and there we are, alone with our thoughts. Perhaps then, age-old stories of psychic dreams really are evidence that deep in the subconscious there lies the power to tap into a sixth sense. Whatever the explanation, the evidence of Maimonides is that dream telepathy could be a reality. Mainstream science is going to have to push and shove and expand and revise in order to accommodate what we found out in the dream telepathy experiments, in the Gansfeld experiments. The direction that science has been taking uh, over the last few hundred years is completely consistent with a worldview which will eventually not only explain but fully predict that things like telepathy must exist. If a new science of consciousness is to emerge, it will need to encompass the potential of the sleeping mind to receive information not available to us when we're awake. As of now, we have only glimpsed the possibilities. Requires incredible proof. We actually know a great deal about what's required to travel across space at high speed. The interstellar space travel is very unlikely. It seems preposterous. We should not, therefore, expect extraterrestrials to visit us.
Is anyone out there? Are they already here? What usually happens is that a light begins to shine in the rooms and then there's this humming noise and I may see figures, creatures, beings, a small sort of slender body with very long arms, but the main thing that I remember was this just very large angular head and these tremendously powerful huge black eyes. Thousands of people report terrifying visitations by unearthly beings. But now they aren't the only ones to set their gaze on extraterrestrials. Deep in the California desert, science and science fiction are about to converge. It doesn't take much to convince you that there should be life out there. Our being here, our planet, our solar system, is a completely normal phenomenon. No freak situations were required for us to be here. We've seen much increasing evidence of the presence of other planetary systems, and in our chemical laboratories on Earth, we found a multitude of chemical pathways by which life, like the life on Earth, could have formed. And therefore, what we have here should exist in many places. There are many places in the universe. So many trillions of stars, there's no name for the number. So even though it takes an amazing combination of ingredients for life to evolve, scientists believe the odds are that somewhere in that vastness, there's another piece of stellar real estate, a place that has it all, especially a source of energy. A star like our own sun, not too near and not too far away. The surface of the planet would have to contain all sorts of chemical elements, but those are common throughout the universe. The waters of a rich primordial soup, charged with high doses of energy, would fuse organic molecules into the precursors of living cells. Then, millions of years later, that is, one-celled creatures, life itself. On a very few planets, about 10,000 is a conservative estimate, life might actually take hold and thrive. From there, it's a short leap to intelligent beings. And eventually, the invention of radio. Astronomers say intelligent creatures would discover radio waves and use them to communicate, just as we did. And that's how we could discover them. October 12, 1992. The 500th anniversary of Columbus's landfall in the New World. NASA has chosen this day to throw a big party in the desert as it launches perhaps the most far-reaching quest in the history of exploration. The world's most powerful radio telescopes are about to begin an unprecedented search for extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI, for short. SETI astronomers will be listening to deep space with some of the most intricate hardware ever engineered and with as much zeal and curiosity as any UFO buff. No, I, I believe there are other civilizations that we can detect, and proving the existence of that civilization will be beyond astonishing. Sometimes you forget what's going on here. I mean, you get wrapped up in the hardware. That's that, that's, a, all of that is very interesting, but it, it's easy to lose sight of the really the big picture. What you're really trying to do is to revolutionize the way mankind thinks about his place in the universe, and one shouldn't lose sight of it. Or her place. Or her place. Actually, can you, can you imagine what it would be like to actually know that there was another race 
of creatures somewhere else, it would force us to see ourselves as one humanity. If we find that we are not alone, that will change Western civilization in a very fundamental way, the way Copernicus did. <laughs> SETI telescopes will hear mostly static, the natural noise of the cosmos. What they're listening for is a needle in a cosmic haystack, a distinct signal amid the noise. For all the high-end gear, SETI comes down to searching for a good station on the radio, a tuner with billions of channels on its dial. You, you tune your ordinary radio dial, you might have it might take you a minute to go through the whole dial, and there, there's a possibility of 25, 50 stations there. But we've got billions of channels to check, not 25 or 50. And for us to go over and tune the radio dial, but it'll take thousands of years if we did it one channel at a time. To get us electric. Unfortunately, E.T. didn't send us a postcard saying, look, uh, I'll be at uh, 1427 megahertz and uh, listen for me. We don't know. Now, NASA has the tools to channel surf the cosmic dial. Scientists believe that's how we'll find them. But some people say they have already found us. It was really a traumatic experience. Rusty Hudson is a writer from New York. He leads an utterly normal life, except for one thing. I was turning back to face the light, and instantaneously I was gone from that room, and was like outside amongst the trees, and looking up and seeing one of these creatures as being this... It's, it's ludicrous, it's crazy. And yet, here we are. Here's this pile of, of experience, of, of sane... Uh, normal people from all over the world reporting the same stuff. Hundreds of purported abductees do tell similar stories. Many have had missing time episodes. One moment they're at one place, the next at another. And they have no idea what happened in between. It does sound crazy. Immediately following this experience, I began having nightmares. This homemaker from New Jersey doesn't want her name revealed. Day. Her experience um, and, uh, occurred Mike in the early 70s. Began having, suffering from anxiety attacks, and he had to be hospitalized once. But still, we couldn't figure out what happened to us. It's a beautiful summer day. We just had a very nice weekend at the Jersey Shore. So we were both in very good and happy moods. And we were just we chit-chatting. The radio was playing. In Tennessee today, the king, Elvis Presley, was hospitalized for recurrent... And the next thing we know, it's dark. We had just gone split-second to split-second from a very happy close moment together to sitting in a parked car in the dark in a field. Our last memory when we found ourselves sitting in the parked car was driving in the car with the sun shining at noon. And then? And then we were in the parked car in the dark, engine off. As though no time had passed as far as we could recollect. Under hypnosis, I could see clearly driving up to a large round craft and some beings escorted me into this craft. Um, I recall four or five of these beings. I don't know what they were doing, but it was petrifying and real. But SETI astronomers say abduction stories can't be real. Interstellar travel flies in the face of the laws of physics. 
well, there's a simple matter of moving matter, mass, stuff, at huge velocities over the vast distances between the stars. A simple probe, even to the nearest star, uh, it may take 100 or 200 or 300 years. From a physicist's point of view, that's damned incredible. And why have they gone to this rather uh, extraordinary method of sending uh, spacecraft, which nobody but unconfirmable reports can find, and not bother to send us a simple radio message that half the receivers on Earth could pick up. It's in just incredibly easier to send things by radio. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence was founded more than 30 years ago by the astronomer Frank Drake. He used one of the world's first radio telescopes in a modest search for signals from space. Back then, his ideas were almost as marginal as tales of flying saucers. The idea that there might be life elsewhere in the universe was sort of taboo in science. And to, to work on it, to talk about it, was considered something that perhaps uh, bona fide scientists didn't do. It was the 50s after all. Monsters from outer space were invading movie houses. UFOs were landing everywhere, and even though scientists weren't meant to take part in the fun, Drake couldn't ignore that the question of extraterrestrials was in the air. On the ground, powerful radio towers were beaming Wolfman Jack, Cousin Brucey, and Alan Freed across huge distances to receivers everywhere. Drake might have wondered. A Buick LeSabre could easily pick up Elvis. So could they, out in deep space, hear Elvis too? He realized the only thing fast enough to travel between hugely distant civilizations was radio, not rockets. Even a slow tune goes 186,000 miles a second, the speed of light. So Elvis reached Jupiter in less than an hour. Somewhere near the stars, Castor and Pollux, 200 trillion miles away. There may be a planet where Elvis lives, amid radio listening beings. The king would be reaching them right about now. The space probe Voyager would need 700,000 years to catch up. And that is why Frank Drake says we'll never meet ETs. My hunch, and uh, of course I'm only guessing, is that we will never really meet them. Not in person. We will talk to them, we will know everything about them. Uh, just as we learn about other cultures through television. But I think a direct contact is very unlikely. The problem with that is it assumes that uh, uh, that intelligence is going to be like us. And it begs the possibility that an intelligence that was like hundreds of thousands of years ahead of us would have overcome the problems of interdimensional travel, would have overcome the problem of manifesting in our world from wherever. Dr. John Mack is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's helped nearly a hundred abductees reconstruct their experiences. Relax. Put your eyelids rest heavily. I know it seems bizarre to other people when they first hear it, but why not? Why shouldn't there be other intelligences, and why shouldn't they be reaching us? And yes, it takes a bizarre form. Yes, they're funny little beings with big black eyes, but uh, here they are. When you got to the bottom of the stairs, uh, what did you notice? Oh, when the door opened, there was... It looked like about 
five of them. BT standing there. They were. They were. The color of the face. They were like ashen white. They got the big eyes. There's no pupil. The basic description, which is highly complex and detailed, are almost identical one to another from hundreds of people. Dr. Mack conducts frequent support group meetings with abductees. For many, is this is the only place they feel comfortable talking talk about, about their experiences. experiences. Other than the most intimate kind of situation. It's outrageous. I mean, the first thing is, this is crazy. This is, this is tabloids. This is Elvis. You know, this is stuff, you know, what's the matter with me? I've never seen Elvis. I've never met anyone who's seen Elvis. And I have seen ETs. I have seen beings that are non-human, and I've met plenty of people who have, too. Show me. Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? I mean, we had an earthquake in, 18, in 1989, and a section of the Bay Bridge fell through, and a car drove into it, and it was a tragedy. We have videotape of that incident. Nobody was expecting it. Nobody was planning it. Somehow, when a UFO lands, oh, the video camera didn't work. Oh, I left my camera at home. There isn't any tangible evidence. If somebody would walk into my office with, a, with an ashtray or a radio knob from a UFO, in a sense, that's job security. That would be terrific. Well, now hundreds of thousands of people uh, possibly are reporting that something is happening to them and they are of sound mind, but because we can't find a cigarette lighter left by the aliens who wouldn't expect to be detected anyway, are we to say that this is not happening, that this doesn't exist? If it's so common and so frequent, why haven't I seen it? What's wrong with my lawn? Um, I just... It has to be proven. And no one can do that. They simply haven't got the physical evidence. But SETI has no hard evidence either. Not yet, anyway. And in some high places, there are people who believe any interest in extraterrestrial life deserves derision, not tax dollars. Madam President, the amendment I am offering today will eliminate funding for what I believe to be a foolish and wasteful NASA program the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, has attracted ridicule and derision. On October 1st, 1993, less than a year after the beginning of the sky survey, SETI was dead. But an act of Congress can't kill human curiosity. The search was bound to go on, with scientists or without them. In California, Dr. Stephen Greer, surgeon, is leading an expedition into the desert night. No telescopes, no computers. The tool is telepathy. The goal, a very close encounter. A close encounter of the fifth kind is a significant new category because it's the first category where humans are making an initiative uh, to contact and interact with these objects. And that's, I think, very significant. I mean, after all, this is our home planet. If these are visitors from other planetary systems, I think it would behoove the citizens of this planet to find a way of saying, uh, welcome here. And take something, I don't care if it's a flashlight, and try to signal to it and try to get it to land and try to interact with it, if they, of course, have the courage and the, uh, the will to do so. primary in the event that there's a landing and an opportunity to go on board, you will come on board, okay, John? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you need to stay behind to document that. Uh, I'll be boarding party member number one. We can just go around two, two three, three four. four, skip you. Five. Uh, six, seven. And you'll stay behind. The problem I have with the, uh, the scientists in SETI listening for microwave signals from deep space is that when they're already landing on terra firma uh, on this Earth uh, and are being reported by people and governments all over the world, I think it would behoove us to look in our own atmosphere before we start looking at uh, millions of light years away. I, I do think that in the next uh, two to five years that we will have a landing and that we will go on board. Uh, I've made plans for this. I've, uh, quite frankly, have transferred all my assets to my wife's name. Uh, my children are aware of this. It's something that I have taken a great deal of time to plan.
no SETI astronomer has made arrangements to join Dr. Greer's boarding party. But the scientists do have plans of their own. Stunning million dollar donations have brought SETI back to life. Once again, the search is on. And the astronomers are more hopeful than ever that they'll finally find their radio station in the sky. The first time you make the detection, you say, well, this might be interesting, but we've had 8,000 or 25,000 interference signals. Why should this one be any different? So we do a follow-up. In fact, what happens is when you find a suspicious signal is you go through a whole list of steps to confirm that this is really and an extraterrestrial say, signal. So make absolutely sure. And then the next time you try again, then you really start scratching your head and you're saying, could this be some strange military aircraft flying a peculiar flight pattern? And that takes a while because you have to confirm it from several telescopes. When you start getting to that stage, then you start saying, well, maybe this is it. Maybe this and is it. And that's when you... I can't say it on camera. <laughs> I mean, the words are really, holy shit, right? I mean, that's what it's going to feel like. That would be the discovery of the millennium, that's for sure. And I mean the next one as well. I think there's probably a lot of intelligence in the universe. I honestly do think we'll find something. I, I, I don't know if it'll be in the next five years, or maybe not even in the next ten years. But I, in my gut, I, I'm willing to bet anybody will find something in the next ten years. Recently, the Hubble Space Telescope found the strongest evidence yet, suggesting the existence of planets beyond our solar system. Are we alone in the night of the universe? Is anybody out there? Out there? Out there? Out there? Out there? What we're trying to do with the opening shot is create the point of view of the UFO flying in, point of view of some kind of extraterrestrial. One of the questions asked. There was a, there was a political leader, which name I cannot say. It wasn't, he's not my friend, but between my friends, he was. Durante la gita, li, vicin, uh, yes, in the ride in the Hudson River, a filmare per alcuni secondi. he had been able to mm, film just a few seconds, but Un he had been able si to. Di colpo di agli occhi. An object that uh, suddenly appeared in front of his eyes. Guardate. Let's see. These are the twins. <coughs> In the original audio, you can hear the voices and music and everything. Il cameraman si è scioccato. Ha dato questo filmato agli analisti ufologi. The cameraman, uh, this friend, has shocked himself. And he has given this uh, footage to the ufologist. Sono stati analizzati. It has been analyzed. E vedete che il movimento dell'oggetto è all'inverso del movimento della And it's very important for you to see that the movement of the cameraman is contrary to the movement of the shape of the spaceship itself. Qui nel vostro paese, here in your country, anche gli UFO visitano. <laughs> also the UFO are visiting here. Diciamo soprattutto in questo paese. Uh, let's say, first of all, in this country. Quando è stato questo? 1994. 1994. Uh, the object disappears slowly. A kind of uh, how do you say it? materialization? Uh, a vanishment, well, 
dematerialization. Vedete? Let's see. Thank you to everyone. Si vede ancora? You can see it. Fino a quando sparisce? Yet. And at the end, it disappeared. Pieri, portami all'immagine degli extraterrestri direttamente. Ho qualcosa da dirvi. I have something to say you. Prima di chiudere questa mia breve relazione. Before I finish my, my speech. Gli extraterrestri, the extraterrestrials sulla Terra, on the Earth, se ne manifestano di varie razze. Are showing themselves. Un'altra razza molto particolare che And ci visita. This is another race visiting, visiting us. Queste fotografie sono state fatte a 50 km dalla mia casa da uno sconosciuto che uh, poi è diventato amico. Next photo is I have taken a 50 km more or less from my home of, by one person which now is my friend. Che si è trovato questo essere nella sotto casa sua. They have seen this being nel under nel magazzino di casa. And uh, basement. È molto strano. It's very strange. Ho dato queste fotografie agli analisti. I have given, I have given this photo to the, to the researchers. Il dottor Jaime Maussan. And Jaime Maussan, presidente de, del programma di investigazione in Messico. The head of programmas di investigazione in Mexico. Ha analizzato queste foto. Have analyzed these photographs. Ha fatto vedere anche degli scienziati di, biologici and he has showed these photographs to biologists e loro hanno visto che questo essere assomiglia le caratteristiche a, a un animale che si chiama salamandra oh and yeah. uh, the, the problem is la parola il problema è la parola de, he says that the, this biologist says that this being is very similar to a kind of reptile I don't know the name but his name in Spanish is Salamandra, Salamandra. How is it? Eh, Salamandra <laughs> okay. Quindi, it was my problem Salamandra forse so maybe la sua razza proviene dai rettili his race is coming from the reptilians avanti veloce tutti gli esseri che ci visitano all the beings that are visiting, visiting us per quello che io so che the... sui campi di grano dell'Inghilterra abbiamo in versione integrale il filmato realizzato in Australia di cui abbiamo già preso conoscenza parlando delle astronavi che avevano la straordinaria capacità di dividersi in volo, in parti separate e indipendenti. Il filmato è stato girato nello zoo della città di Sydney da un turista italiano di nome Bertini. È di notevole interesse in questo film la presenza contemporaneamente all'UFO di vari punti di riferimento a terra, quali le costruzioni dello zoo e l'albero nella parte finale del filmato dietro il quale si nota chiaramente l'oggetto col suo alone rossastro, dovuto all'energia elettromagnetica che lo muove. Sono inoltre molto importanti sia l'audio del nastro, dal quale traspare oltre ai rumori di fondo che ci confermano che il film è girato effettivamente allo zoo, che le citazioni dell'operatore mentre filma l'oggetto che compare in cielo. Nei primi fotogrammi si nota inoltre una persona che indica nella direzione dell'oggetto stesso, confermandoci che anche altre persone hanno notato il fenomeno. Abbiamo ora un filmato realizzato in una spiaggia di Sebastopoli, città della Crimea, in Ucraina, nell'ex Unione Sovietica. Il film è girato da un operatore amatoriale di nome Nikolai Igorov, che filmava scene ricordo familiari e che ha consegnato personalmente il film a Giorgio Bongiovanni, il quale si trovava in Russia in uno dei suoi numerosi viaggi. Ascoltiamo adesso e vediamo l'originale sonoro del video della Gran Bretagna di Norfolk. Ascoltiamo con molta attenzione le imprecazioni e le parole che i pescatori dicono mentre vedono questa straordinaria astronave.
I do. You, you've got to have a fucking look at that through this place. It looks superb. I tell you what, you ain't gonna fucking believe you're fucking talking for do ya? Ecco, video ovni, si dice così, lo viene nominato così dagli specialisti, per noi è un'astronave extraterrestre. Alla vostra sinistra possiamo vedere il video dell'astronave filmata in Crimea, in Ucraina, nella ex Unione Sovietica, il 15 agosto 1993. Alla vostra destra il video dell'astronave eh, girato a Norfolk, in Gran Bretagna, il 26-10-1993. most completely uh, diminished. 90% of all reported or recorded UFO sightings occur at night. Only 10% are seen during daytime hours and are rarely captured on tape or film. Along with the increase in daylight sightings has been covered out over the beach, over the shoreline, and uh, I dashed over to the, towards the sand dunes and dropped to my knees and uh, started filming it. This is what Ed Walters captured on videotape. The shaded, disc-shaped object appears to hover overhead, then abruptly disappears. There she is, right there. Oh, my God. Just hovering right there. Oh, 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 Jesus. When you know it. Jeff Senyo is a video analyst with MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. Recognized worldwide as an expert in his field, Senyo believes Walters' tape is authentic. Notice particularly when he sees the object, how the oscilloscope shows that the camera was indeed bounced around. You'll see a lot of video disturbance there, which is typical of a raw video of a camera that's been bounced around. That eliminates editing as a possibility for creating this thing. There she is, right there. Ed Walters is no stranger to UFO documentation. He snapped the first Gulf Breeze UFO photograph in 1987. He also took this picture, which he believes is a near miss between a UFO and a fighter jet. And the jet had, was continuing on and passed right, looked to me like it was headed right at the UFO. Ed Walters has come under fire from skeptics. The UFO. Talking about UFO.
yell at UFOs 10 hours a day, every day. He sees them at Midway, a small community close to Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, we recently captured a V formation of about 32 huge 50-foot diameter dome objects that are flying in formation. And with, beyond a doubt, they're not geese. You know, uh, there's nothing that suggests a neck or a wing flutter. We have, we have 800 hours of daytime footage of UFOs, anywhere from one to a hundred per day. And for that to happen so blatantly and in broad daylight, I think that's definitely something behind it. What I consider to be profound is when you see something in the sky that is of extraordinary proportions and is sitting there and it's circular and it's just sitting there, you think it's a balloon, but then you look at it and it starts gliding, you know? And then you see other things just flashing by at extreme speeds. And you're, you're saying, ah, am I, are my eyes playing with me, or do I get sky blind, or what is that? And this thing just moves and glides effortlessly. Über Bits und Bytes hat kaum noch Luft zum Atmen. Fotos, Filme, Dokumente, fast alles, was mit UFOs zu tun hat, ist hier gespeichert. Die Stunde der Wahrheit für UFO-Sichtungen und ihre Zeugen schlägt sie hier. Eines der wichtigsten Vorhaben für Illo Brandt von Ludwiger und Rolf-Dieter Klein. Am Nachmittag entsteht dieses Polaroid-Foto. Eigentlich wollte der in Deutschland lebende Italiener Giuseppe Lucifora, von Beruf Kamindesigner, nur ein paar Fotos von seiner Baustelle in Comiso auf Sizilien machen. Und er erwischte dicht neben einer NATO-Basis ein UFO. Ich habe damals eine äh, Skizze gemacht, und zwar folgendes. Hier ist das Haus, das ich fotografiert habe, das ist mein Haus. Das ist der Kommiso, das ist die NATO-Basis. Also ich, mein Haus ist ungefähr ein Kilometer äh, Luftlinie von NATO-Basis entfernt. Ich stand hier und da habe ich dieses Objekt ungefähr hier mal, erst einmal gesehen. Und dann habe ich gesehen, dass in, an diesem Punkt ungefähr, habe ich so einen schwarzen, dieser schwarze Punkt mal gesehen da, ja? äh, Dann habe ich mich umgedreht auf die linke Seite und sehe dieses Objekt so also Richtung Ragusa fliegen. Und äh, bei Ragusa ungefähr habe ich das Gefühl gehabt, dass dieses Objekt auf mich zukam und dann wieder raufging und dann ist verschwunden, also über meinen Kopf sozusagen, ist weggegangen oder weggeflogen. Aus den Polaroid-Fotos von Giuseppe Lucifora haben die Münchner MUFON-Forscher das Aussehen und Verhalten des Comiso-UFOs rekonstruiert. Und per Computer war es sogar möglich, die UFO-Struktur zu berechnen und darzustellen. Was damals, im Juni 1987, auf Sizilien geschah, diese Computeranimation zeigt es. Das Comiso-UFO flog auf seiner Bahn immer in einer Ebene, was auf den einzelnen Fotos nicht zu erkennen war. Mit seinen Fotos in der Hand bat Giuseppe Lucifora bei der NATO und beim Bundesverteidigungsministerium um Aufklärung. Ohne Erfolg. Diese Nachricht elektrisierte vor einigen Jahren die Weltöffentlichkeit. Wir sind zu Gast bei Sobebs in Brüssel, der Gesellschaft zur Erforschung von Weltraumphänomenen. Sie hat die belgischen UFOs wissenschaftlich erforscht. Also diese Karte zeigt die Stellen, wo UFO-Beobachtungen während der belgischen Welle gemacht wurden. Aber nur solche Stellen, wo die Beobachtungen sehr nah waren, das heißt weniger als 300 Meter. Und das begann ganz massiv an einem Abend, am 29. November 1989 in dieser Gegend, das sind die schwarzen Punkte. Tausende von Zeugen haben in Belgien UFOs gesehen. Die UFO-Welle begann im November 1989 und dauerte mehrere Jahre. Unter den ersten Zeugen die Gendarmen Nicole und von Montigny von der Brigade Eupen. Am 29. November sind sie auf der N68 Richtung deutsche Grenze unterwegs, als sie ein UFO bemerken. Es flog so nach vorn. Und die Lichter, die reichten bis zum Boden. Es war taghell am Boden, man hätte ein Buch oder eine Zeitung lesen können. Das hier ist jene Stelle, unweit der Kleinstadt Eupen, wo ein gleißender Lichtfleck die Aufmerksamkeit der Gendarmen erregte. 
Es ist 17.20 Uhr, kurz nach Sonnenuntergang. Ich war, wir waren beide außerhalb des Fahrzeugs und befanden uns rechts vom Fahrzeug. Und man hatte den Eindruck, die kamen zurück. Hier hatte ich persönlich keine Angst. Der Physikprofessor und UFO-Forscher Dr. August Meessen hat uns noch einmal geschildert, wie alles begann. Die beiden Gendarmen von Montigny und Nicole fuhren in dieser Richtung nach Aachen. Und an dieser Stelle bemerkten sie plötzlich auf der Wiese ein sehr starkes Licht, das überhaupt nicht dorthin gehörte. Das war das Zentrum lag 50 Meter von der Straße weg und äh, das war ungeheuer hell beleuchtet bis etwa 20 Meter zur Straße hin. Dann haben sie sich umschaut, wo dieses Licht herkam und entdeckten dann in einer Höhe von ungefähr 120 Meter eine Plattform mit drei sehr großen weißen Scheinwerfer, die ein starkes weißes Licht nach unten schicken. Wir haben aus zahlreichen Zeugenaussagen und Protokollen den UFO-Flug von Eupen zum ersten Mal für das Fernsehen per Computer exakt rekonstruiert. Und damit auch gut zu erkennen ist, wo und wie das November-UFO geflogen ist, haben wir seine Flugbahn von der Dunkelheit ins Tageslicht verlegt. Maschine der dritten Art 1989 über Eupen, Irrtum ausgeschlossen. Von Hunderten gesehen, ein dreieckiger Flugkörper, 30 Meter lang, 2 Meter hoch. Jahrelang haben Zeugen immer wieder von UFOs über Belgien berichtet und dabei einen völlig neuen Aspekt in die UFO-Forschung gebracht. Denn von den Teller- oder kugelförmigen UFOs, von denen sonst immer die Rede ist, unterschieden sich die belgischen Objekte erheblich. Was anderes ist, ist nämlich, dass es meistens Plattformen waren. Das heißt, der Boden war flach. Hier ist ein Beispiel. Die äußeren Formen konnten verschieden sein. Das hier ist ein Dreieck mit äh, gebogenen Seiten. Sehr oft gab es drei große Lichter, riesig große Lichter, konnten einen Durchmesser zum Beispiel haben von zwei Meter. Äh, nicht in diesem Fall, aber in anderen Fällen ein rotes, blinkendes Licht in der Mitte. Was natürlich entscheidend ist, ist, dass solche Objekte den Eindruck geben, wirklich materiell zu sein, eine besondere Struktur zu haben. Es sind aber keine Tragflächen da, es sind keine Propeller und keine Düsen da. Also versteht man im Grunde nicht, wie das funktionieren kann. Und dann kann man von etwas Unidentifiziertem sprechen. Dieses Foto ist einzigartig. Es zeigt eines der belgischen UFOs, zufällig von einem Amateur aufgenommen, am 7. April 1990. Nur ein paar Lichtpunkte? Nein, das Bild zeigt weit mehr. Die wissenschaftliche Analyse der Vorlage enthüllt, das geheimnisvolle Dreieck ist aus Materie. Eine wichtige Adresse für die UFO-Forschung, die Königlich-Belgische Militärhochschule in Brüssel. Wo sonst Bildauswerter mit hochmoderner Computertechnik für die NATO, für Geheimdienste und für das deutsche Bundeskriminalamt arbeiten, hier wurde der Fotobeweis für das belgische UFO kritisch unter die Hightech-Lupe genommen und für echt befunden. Punkt 
Punkt für Punkt, Schicht für Schicht haben die Militärexperten das Foto analysiert, sich an mögliche Geheimnisse herangetastet. Fragen über Fragen warten auf Antwort. Wie kommt es, dass UFOs so lautlos fliegen? Wie sind die plötzlichen Ortsveränderungen mit vielfacher Schallgeschwindigkeit zu erklären? Wie funktioniert der Antrieb von UFOs? Dazu gehört natürlich die Frage, wie sich diese Objekte ohne Tragflügel und ohne Propeller und Düsen bewegen können. Nun wissen wir, dass wir selbst, um uns zum Beispiel beim Schwimmen fortzubewegen, mit unseren Händen das Wasser nach hinten rücken. Wir üben auf das uns umgebende Fluidum eine Kraft aus. Ein UFO könnte dasselbe machen, aber ohne mechanische Kräfte. Es genügte dafür, die Luft zu ionisieren. Und das ist, was vielleicht, ich bin immer vorsichtig, hier der Fall ist, nämlich, dass hier Luft ionisiert wurde, das zeigt das ultraviolette Licht. Und The city prepared for darkness. Shortly after 1 p.m., 17 different people, unknown to each other,